Hello, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with the lovely Clay Blair. How are you? Hey, good, man. How are you? I'm rather... I'm actually very excited. Uh, we've been here probably half an hour, 45 minutes or so now, sort of shooting the schnizzle, yeah. talking about stuff. And I've come to you through two different directions. Number one, my wife, about two or three years ago, said to me, you have to go and check out this guy's studio. Right. You'd it, written to me through my website. Right. She told me about it. But I didn't have a channel then. Right. And I was probably just being my usual workaholic self. But then Shelley said to me the other day, Shelley Yakis, yeah. oh, he said, I hear the producer's workshop's going again. Yeah. You've got to get over there. Yeah. So that's when I got in contact with you and I put, put everything together. Yeah. So for those, you know what, I'm going to let you do all the talking. Okay. So for, it's now called Boulevard Recording. Yes. Um, but it's essentially pretty darn identical to the original place with the pegboard walls, yeah. which I love. just makes me feel like classic LA studio. Well, the reason that the, 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 the pegboard walls are here is because when we got here, it was, this whole room was carpet. Oh, it was carpet? Oh, yeah. And if you tried to listen to a mix, your high end was just, I mean, it was really rough, I thought. Right. So I had found out that, you know, um, West Beach had done that. They put carpet over the walls. Um, and it wasn't what was here in the 70s. It was a deader room in the 70s, but it was uh, a transparent material. Um, West Beach is dead in the hell out of it. So we took it off and I actually found some of the guys um, that had worked in here in the 70s, Bill Schnee, Rick mm -hmm. Ruggieri, and I was asking them, so what was behind these walls before you guys had treated them? And he said it was this Armstrong studio tile. And believe it or not, they still make it. Oh, they do? Yeah. Oh, wow. And so we were able to get, uh, redo the control room as it was, uh, probably 1969, 1970, which before Producers Workshop, this was briefly called Continental Recording. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, which uh, a, a guy named Larry Brown was involved very early on. He actually helped build this room, and he's still around. He scores now. Uh, he has lots of stories. Um, a lot of kind of American uh, psychedelic rock bands are recording here. Moby Grape, I believe, uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service, their first yeah? record. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And he had a band as well. I think they were called The Arrows. Um, and he played in the band and he worked here. And then I believe right after that, probably like 70, 71, um, it was taken over by Liberace's manager, Seymour Heller. Which is an, an insane piece of history. Yeah. 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 Um, but that being said, this control room hasn't changed. I mean, as far as what you see, it's a little square room. <laughs> you know, it's a tiny little old school control room. And I love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. So for just skipping to some key points, for those people that don't know, a lot of the wall was done here. Yeah. And uh, you've had Bob Resran here. I've researched you. I saw the photographs of yeah. you and Bob in here. Yeah. Um, which is a, a huge connection for me. And we were, we were bonding about off camera, like yeah. the New York scene of the late Absolutely. 60s through to early 80s. Absolutely. Is one of, being English, one of the most influential periods. Right. Because it's, it covers the Velvet Underground, covers all of Roy Sakala, Shelley Yakis, yeah. and Jack Douglas, and Bob Badgerman's records. Absolutely. Which can be John Lennon on one side, can be. Uh, Patti Smith, Radio right. Ethiopia, obviously. I mean, all of these incredible records were done in New York yep. with those guys. So Shelley was the one, you know, who made a lot of those amazing records that you have to come and check this place out. Absolutely. So, so very excited. But The Wall, for me, is a very special yeah. record. Well, Bob told me that he had first started working here, I think it was in 74, 75, he worked on an Alice Cooper record, um, Lace and Whiskey. Uh, and that was done partially here and I think partially at Sunset. I might be wrong, but... I think it was Sunset because Jack told me a little bit about yeah. Sunset and Alice Cooper. Um, but he, I, I guess he kept it in his hat and in 78, late 78, um, when it, I guess it was decided that he was going to work on the wall, um, they decided to book this room out for, they were here probably three, four months. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so they basically, you know, a lot of it's actually very funny. I've tried to fix a Wikipedia because on Wikipedia, someone wrote in a book that the wall was finished at Cherokee. Absolutely not at all. Um, 
from the horse's mouth, Bob spent an entire afternoon with me. The Cherokee, they did tape transfers. Right. Um, they may have done a vocal overdub at uh, Cherokee, but everything in LA was done here. They did drums in England with Nick Mason, uh, and they had a falling out with Nick. And so the band came over without Nick and basically did all the overdubs for the record in here. Uh, they recorded Mother from Scratch with Jeff Percaro playing drums here. I heard that, yeah. Um, but it was running the full, there was a, you know, a, a, in here they were doing overdubs with Roger. And we had a mix room next door, and that was where Bob was a lot of the time. Um, and so Roger would go back and forth, Bob would go back and forth, and they began mixing it. I, I think they started to mix it probably about halfway through that three-month period. Um, in the other room. And I remember asking Bob what they used because I know for a fact that the mix room here had, uh, have you ever heard of Quantum, Quantum Labs? They're, uh, they're California-based console company and they usually were famous for making broadcast consoles. Very small, uh, I don't think they made a console larger than 24 and I believe this one was 16. Very basic, nothing crazy. In this room? Not in this room, in the mix room. In the mix room? For the wall. So I think uh, what they did, Bob told me, is they rented one or two BCM sidecars. So the wall was mixed through two or three consoles at once. Um, That's fantastic. With the Stevens, con with the Stevens tape machine. Bob the Stevens his, tape machine. Yeah, there were Stevens in here, and Bob brought his Stevens, I believe, for the mix room. Um, so in here, the console was actually... Uh, uh, a custom board that was that had la a launcher of an AM16 front end mm -hmm. and uh, Alltech 251A EQs, but this studio was famous for gutting everything. They had no transformers anywhere. This guy named Bud Wyatt, um, he was the tech, uh, and this guy Steve Hazelton as well with the Mastering Lab. They went on this trip, and you know, in the late 70s, everybody did kill the transformers. You know, the color. The, they, everybody wanted something clean. So they had this whole console without transformers, um, as well as a lot of the outboard. There are some very famous LA-2As that the Mastering Lab had uh, when it was still open that were transformerless. Which was next door. Yeah. Mastering Lab. Yeah. 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 Duck sex. Um, and you know, we, these Alltech speakers, which you'll see later, have been here for a long time. And he, the Mastering Lab made the crossover for those. And those were very popular through all sorts of studios. Yeah, I used to have little gold tannoys with the there you Doug go. mastering that. There you go. So there's a lot of history in this little room. The wall, also in that era, uh, Steely Dan did some basic tracks for Asia here. Um, and it was, again, that clean, dead sound because of the lack of transformers. You know, Steven's tape machines don't have transformers. Um, so they were very unlikely to hit transformers. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Because now we live in a world of purely digital, yeah. where we're trying to get color because oh, we're know. so used to transformers in, in A and mic pre's and compressors, EQs, but also in the tape machines, and of course the fact that tape, yeah. you know, you know, creates another sound yeah. together. Well, it's funny. I've I've talked to some of these guys that worked here, and 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 I was asking them. I remember. Um, when I first got this room, I found Bill Schnee and uh, Rick Ruggieri, and I said, I'll buy you guys lunch, will you tell me some stories? Great. Uh, and so they were telling me the, you know, just a lot of different types of stories about what happened in the room and their experiences, and, and I, I think I asked Rick, what's with the no transformer things? Like, you know, I, don't, I don't understand why, I don't think that sounds good. And they, said that, they both said that they changed their minds. They changed their minds and went back to Transformers? I think so. Oh, they did? Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, you know what? That's not correct. It was Steve Hazelton that said that, who was the head tech here. Oh, is it? Yeah. I mean, a lot of times as engineers, you come in and you just, you, you make it work. Yeah. yeah. So studios, you know, do things that they do, but as long as you can get it to sound good, you know, yeah. you're working with an artist, as you know, and they're demanding you know, that you capture a performance, you're not going to go, hey, could you tell me what op amp is, you know what I mean? Yeah, you, right, right, you know, right, right. You're right. not thinking that way. So, well, that's amazing. I mean, the fact that any of the wall was done here, let alone most of it, is yeah. pretty incredible. I had heard that about Jeff Picaro playing. Yeah. Um, I'll show you where he played in a little bit. Okay, that would yeah. be great. So, 
So you took this place over, what, seven years ago now? About seven years, yeah. And it was in rough shape. Um, the, West, the West Beach guys, it was a punk studio. So let me backtrack. I think about 92, 93, um, the studio was privately owned for a few years after producers closed. And then in the early 90s, um, Brett Gerwitz and Epitaph took the studio over and called it West Beach. Um, which actually also has some pretty cool history. There's the first Blink-182 record, uh, the first Offspring, maybe the second Offspring, the very first Sublime record was done here. Fantastic. Um, and my favorite from that era was Mazzy Star did Fade Into You, or the records So That Tonight I Might See Here. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I remember those records. Yeah. I mean, all those records you know, I, I, I know very well, but yeah. Fade Into You is wonderful. Actually. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, so tell us a little about this beautiful console. So this is a rare API, as in uh, they didn't make many 48-frame APIs in this era. This was a... What year? This is 76, 75. Nice. Um, so this is right on the, the edge of being a Datatronics console. Um, but basically, this was made custom for ABC broadcast. And what we think was Fantastic. the deal was it was a 24... 24, so return, you know, on the right sense. side for broadcast. Uh, that being said, the we kind of got lucky because uh, there's additional cans of Jensen's on the lines on the whole console, which they had for broadcast, but it's been very beneficial to this to the sound of this console. That was that was the thing about the old console that we used to have. Really? The 20 channel was it had so many levels of trans we didn't realize but what's great, and I'm sure you're about to touch yeah. on, is in this digital world of like potential super hot signals. Yeah. You just put something in here and it soaks, soaks it up, soaks it up, soaks oh, it yeah, up, and yeah. it comes out sounding incredibly fat. Well, that's the thing. I'm, you know, I had a, we had a Trident 80 series in here before, and it was a great board. It's a great rock and roll board, but you really had to watch your gain staging. You had to watch how hard you hit things, your master bus. If you if you went beyond zero, even even just touching into the red, you know, there were hints of distortion. This thing, you can peg it. I mean, you can turn this thing all the way up and, and just be in the red all the time, and it's hard to get distortion. I found with my API, um, if I was tracking stuff that yeah. somebody else was going to mix, yeah. they struggled hard to match the roughs. Yeah, it's, not right. because, it's not because yeah. of what I was doing, it was just that there's something, it, I don't know about you, but it almost feels like everything's kind of parallel compressed. Everything just yeah. has a little bit more weight to it. It does. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, and it's a very, you know, uh, a round and open, bright, punchy, fast sound. And it's not, um, the thing is I can't find anything that it's bad for. Great. That's the beautiful thing is, you know, especially a vocal, you think, oh, Oh, everybody wants to go to a Neve or something hefty for a vocal. But well, for a classic American Californian studio, I can't yeah. think of some, anything better than putting an API Same in. Same here. Yeah. So it's a great work. And so you might notice the uh, the face plates on here are unique. They're this kind of blue gradient design. Yeah. Um, oh, this here. Yeah. yeah, this here. So yeah. luckily when I bought this, I found out that... Um, in between the last buyer who I bought it from, uh, this was sent to API, and Paul Wolf had recapped, repotted, basically refurbished the console. Wow! And that was you know 20 years ago. So when I got it, um, Did all that work done to it. Yeah, there's very little Beautiful. that we had to do. Yeah, and this is and this black, as I was saying earlier, is so black. Has yeah. that been redone as well? It may have been. He may have redone the uh, those as well. But yeah, um, it's a beautiful idea. It's like it, it, it's like blue in the middle, API blue to black on the edges. Right. Pretty pretty tasty. Yeah. Yeah, it's very unique. And so what? It, so essentially, you've got it loaded as it's a forty 14, channel. That's yeah. More than enough. Yeah. My SSL is only forty, and I've still got spare channels I'm not using. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Absolutely. That's beautifully. Um, how's the monitor section? How do you monitor from it? Uh, the monitor section's good. We cleaned it up a bit, actually. We, um, you know, because if you monitor through the API, you hear the API. Yeah. There's a lot of 2520s. There's a lot of transformers. So in the modern age, you know, everyone wants to hear what their converters are doing as close as possible. Um, so what we did was um, 
we actually pulled some of the 2520s out and put in replacement 2520s that are uh, chip based that are actually completely transparent. Um, it doesn't change the sound of anything except what comes out of the speakers and it basically just simplifies it to be more what's coming out of your converters. I see. So you're hitting all your transformers and your 2520s on the way in, but you're monitoring. Oh yeah. You're monitoring closer, which obviously is probably what I wasn't doing and why yeah. people would get frustrated trying to match the sounds. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it is tricky because, um, you know, when you, I remember we were listening back and forth when we were, we were working on this monitor section and, um, you know, the, the API monitor section's tighter. You get, when you listen closer to the converter on the same thing, we, we would have it molted so we could go back and forth. Uh, you lose some low-end information um, and you lose some high-end information, but that's not a bad thing. Right. It's just being a commercial studio, I thought, you know what? If somebody is not used to the API sound when, they're, when it's coming out of the speakers, let's make it so that what comes out of the speakers is what they hear out of the converters. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And then all the coloration is deliberate. They're making oh, a yeah. choice on the Oh, absolutely. Way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And use the buses. You use the buses, you get uh, another 2520 and another transformer. I can't help noticing you've got the usual 550s, A's, B's, 554s. Yep. But then you've got the APSI yeah. here. That came with the console, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, that's an interesting EQ. Um, there's not a lot on them out there. They, they kind of, um, correct me if I'm wrong, they came out a few years after, I It's guess, continuously variable. Yeah, there's no steps. There's no steps. They were kind of a cheaper option to APIs, EQs, um, and they're cool, man. They're really colorful. Um, they're not super sharp, so they're very broad. They're very broad EQs, right. which, you know. Which in an analog world is kind of nice. Yeah. We're in digital now, and we can get there, and we can pull out right. like, the slither thin piece of EQ that we don't yeah, want. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I hear you. And the 554s are actually have the option to be pretty narrow, which is helpful. Yeah. Um, those are cool EQs. Beautiful. All right, so are you monitoring with Dyn Audio and NS10s? Yes. Great. I have the Dyn Audios for 15 years. Oh, so you know them well. Very well. We have this conversation all the time. You know, what are the best speakers? The ones you know really well. Yeah. In a room you know really well. Yeah. And there's, a, there's some really nice outboard that's... Uh, yeah. Quite eclectic. I, I love this. Oh yeah, those and are great. This is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, right, right. No, it's helpful. And you know, I always leave this out. Oh, you do? Yeah, because I like the sound of it. It's it's the original attack setting for the 175s. Um, and just so people know, this side chain function here, it's a, it's a high pass filter, so yeah. it's great on bass guitars in particular for yep. me, like you can compress it with this and just letting all that low end go through is just beautiful. Yep. It's one of the things that I, I've i been talking about a lot recently because I've realized is that what the digital world has done is it's yeah. forced analog manufacturers to give more features. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like so many more compressors now have yeah. mix controls. Uh, yeah, right. Which is genius because then you it can is. smash the schnizzle out of it yeah. and then just bring in a little underneath. Yeah. And it's like yeah. having parallel compression. Parallel compression. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. So, uh, real stay level. Yeah, that, so there's two versions of the, the stay level early on. Um, one is the gray that's actually really similar to this color. And this is the later light gray, which I actually prefer. It's a very, very slight difference in circuit, but I, I find these punchier. They're a little punchier to me. It might have been a different uh, transformer. You mean by punch, you mean just a faster attack? No, I think just punchier as in the tone of the compressor overall is punchier. So it's more mid mid range. More mid range, yeah, more mid range. I'm only saying that because a lot of the time with uh, analogies like warm and transparent yeah, right. stuff, it's good to explain it because some 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 people's transparent and another person's colored. I feel right, like. absolutely, <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. So um, underneath LA2A, yep. you're you getting much use out of that. All every day. What is your what is your preferences for an LA2A? Well, I mean everything I, that would be the one compressor if i could have 10 of i would oh okay so cool. with live tracking you know sometimes snare top but a lot of times recently i've been doing uh front of kit kind of a, like a ribbon like a 44 great la2a vocal you know sometimes i'll do uh the la2a with the 1176 in front of it that's uh, nice um 
Uh, um, going back to the, the gates, what are, you, yeah. what are you using that on a lot? I love that on bass DI. I love it on bass DI, and I love it on some vocals. That's one reason that I love it so much is that sometimes when I'm searching for a vocal sound and no preamp's doing it for me, mm -hmm. the mic seems as close as we're gonna get. Sometimes that, that stay level is the key. It does something, especially with somebody with kind of a grittier, rougher kind of voice. It seems to uh, really make it what it is. It's just a great Fantastic. compressor, yeah. These these are personal favorites of mine yeah. for guitars. And yeah. uh, I, do, I use them on guitars. It was, it was yeah. Dave Sardi that turned me on to them when I was working with, with Sardi. Yeah. And he would always put guitars for them, and I'd never really used them. Yeah. And when I first moved over here in the mid-90s, you could buy those for a couple of hundred dollars. Oh, God. Nobody cared. I know. Now they're vintage. <laughs> I, I bought those for probably 3500 bucks for the pair. I just looked the other day, and there was one going for six grand. Oh, my I just can't believe that. No, 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 it's silly. I, that's silly. I mean, they're, they're, they're a one-sound compressor. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of silly. Let's be honest. It's silliness. Yeah. But if you want that ka, ka, ka guitar oh. sound, I, I always say naively, I'm yeah. naive. Yeah. I always say the Rihanna guitar sound. Like, bah, 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 yeah, right, right. Bah, yeah. Bah, bah, bah. There's just something about yeah. the fixed attack and release or however they're, they're, they're manufactured, which just is so good for percussive guitar parts. Yep. That's also another compressor that is a vocal tone. I use it on vocals. There, there's just, like if you put it up against the LA-2A, LA-2A is so warm and fluffy and it just it just hugs a vocal and it's yeah. beautiful. The LA-3A hugs a vocal but you get this mid-range spit to it. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, no, no other compressor does it. Yeah, they're, they're pretty, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's interesting that they went completely out of favor because everybody, they were like, I know what happens is like we start, we start to, you know, loving tube stuff, oh, valve yeah. stuff. We sure. start loving, and these got really ignored in the noise. Right. When these got popular again, yeah. these got ignored, and and yeah. But now they're back with a vengeance. And so there's the Mercury. Love the Mercury. Yeah, um, I love that thing, man. It, it's it's really. I used to have an old Poltec, and just through the year, you know how it is. You, you buy gear, you sell gear. I was buying a mic and sold my Poltec. I'm well, I mean, it's understand, <laughs> understandable. Let's, let's be honest, Poltecs are so unbelievably expensive. And if you, yeah. if, if you got one, it's like, a, it's like a little investment sitting in, your, yeah. in yourself. So I, I, yeah. I, I hear you, you know, it's, you have to be wise about what you Absolutely. choose. If you're using something yeah. every day, you keep it. Absolutely. If you're using it every three or four yeah. days and it's worth seven or $8,000, you might sell yeah, it. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> no, but I love it. You know, I use it for the usual kind of great things that Poltecs are good for, and that yeah. is, you have a great vocal sound, but you just want a little more. Mm -hmm. Or you have a kick drum in your mixing that just needs some natural sub lows. Or yeah, it's a great. I'm, I'm really impressed with this with the Mercury. Absolutely. Um, EMI, the Chandler, the TG1. I first used that with Saudi as well. Yeah. Yeah. That thing stays on my room mics. Oh, it does. If great. I can help it. Yeah. I, I, for whatever reason, um, with this room, I mean, it's silly to say that, but. It just sounds so great on the rooms, and, and always in limit. It's always limit. Compress is great, but limit on the rooms is just unreal. I also use it. I love to use it on like a uh, like a mid piano mic, like a string mic, like a real smashy, tacky kind Wonderful. of a sound. They're pretty miraculous sounding. Yeah. Um, I don't have one. I probably should. <laughs> They're awesome, man. Another pair of my favorites, some DBX 160s. Oh yeah. Everything. I mean, I, I usually, that's kind of my go-to for kicks top and bottom or kick in and snare top that's going in, yeah. Uh, Great oh, on piano, too. I've never used my piano. Oh. It's my go-to first compressor in a chain for vocals. But, but, it has been for... No kidding. Since I was a kid, yeah. Since I, That was like the only thing I had for a while. Yeah. Because it was the only name compressor I ever yeah. used. And then I started working with Dave Jordan and... and um, Actually, a lot of people do this. Um, so both Dave Jordan and Mike Klink um, do the same thing, which right. is the DBX 160 into the 1176 afterwards. No kidding. And that's 1176 is on 20 to 1. So just you, to get the, the, the peaks? Just to get the peaks. Yeah. And so I started sort of doing something like that, and then Dave Jordan was like, oh, yeah, that's what you do. You should do this, this, and this. And I wow. tweaked my setting, and then I worked with Mike Klink, and he's like, that's, that's my vocal sound. That's, that's awesome. So that's how... You know, that's how they recorded all those vocals. That's and, awesome. But 160, 
you have to be careful with them. You pro I'm sure you know this. It's like once you see the move needle moving, it's compressing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like if the needle's not moving, it's still compressing. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> the cool thing about pianos if you ever try it. You, you know, you let a, a, a chord ring out and you can see the it's so fast, you know, it just yeah. rides the whole thing down. Yeah. It's really gorgeous. That's one of I never tried it. So underneath is that Alan uh, Smart. And Alan Smart. Are you using it on the mix bus? Yes. Great. Always, never in stereo, always individual. Always individual? Yeah. Interesting. I usually, I'm, I'll, you know, some people uh, might think that's a little tedious, but just put a test tone up and, and, and Pro Tools and arm your track and do calibrate and you can line it up. You get something you like on your mix bus and you say, this is pretty close and you go and you do one side and you look at the other one and you, that's how I do it. I've, with stereo, it seems to drag it down in my opinion. Right. I think the low end gets a bit smushy, um, and... There's a couple of people I've, I've worked with over the years that, that, that lit, say the same thing, exactly yeah. the same thing that yeah. you should be doing, should be using them in split mono, so I should, yeah. I should look into that. But mine's built into my console, so... Oh, well, yeah, you're, that's a special, I, I love those. So the, so the 2500, yeah. what are you using it on? I have very mixed opinions on 2500s. What do you use them on, without trying to influence you? Um, I use it on the mix bus occasionally. Oh, Occasionally, yeah. Um, I actually like it on guitars a okay. lot. I think you're sort of going the same way as me. I yeah. like the way it sounds, but yeah. I'm not really a mix bus guy with it. Right. It, it seems to... SSL compressors, Alan Smarts, definitely color the mix. And I like that. But in the way that I, we like, Ex yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the 2500, I think it depends on the medium. Usually, I've found that it's something that's less punchy, like if it's really kind of like a folky thing or an acoustic thing or you know, even a string thing, the 2500 seems to handle it with more ease than the SSL mm -hmm. in my opinion. But I love it on rooms too. It's great on rooms oh, great. as well. Um, I've never tried it on rooms, so I'll try it on that. And it's great on piano. I actually put it on piano as well. Um, but on electric guitars, it's really fun. Acoustic guitars, it's really fun too. Wonderful. 1176 under that? Yep. I have another one, but it's uh, not here. But yeah, that's, that's one I made. This that's the guy is unbelievable. We did a we did a um, we went to uh, Tommy Lee's studio. Oh yeah, and Smiley, um, his engineer, borrowed about three or four of those. Yeah, absolutely. That's our guy. And we tracked drums through it. It's incredible. I, I couldn't believe how good it is. It's incredible. Yeah, that that that's. Um, I want to have another one so I can have two. They're, they're just incredible. In fact, since I've had it. I don't believe there's a record that I've mixed that has not had that on the bass. Wow. Um, I've always been able to make it work with every bass track I've ever sent through it. And it might look severe, you know, when you put a bass through it and you see, oh, well, we're at 15 and 10, it just sit, but it's just, it's, it's unexplainable. Like people that have the plug-in, the, the old plug-in, the old uh, Abbey Road RS124 plug-in, um, you know, a lot of people, either loved them or hated them, but that's because they didn't understand how they worked. The, the way these things work are very different than the plugin. Um, the plugins did like halfway job of how they actually work. And they're still great, but uh, the one feature that Chandler has added, which is their top secret thing, is this fuse mode, which basically this is the, the stock 124 back here, yep. um, which is awesome. What fuse mode does, which they don't want to explain to anyone, but basically it makes everything better. <laughs> everything's a little faster, everything's a little punchier, everything's a little louder. Um, and you know, of course, these, uh, they put these three serial numbers on here, which are actual Abbey Road attack times from the original uh, Abbey Road compressors. And one of these, I was told, uh, it might be the middle one, um, was Jeff Hemrick's McCartney bass attack always. Well, I'm going to be here to say, so um, So I'm glad we're talking about this. Um, I, uh, Jack was over at my house a couple of days ago, Jack Douglas, and he had just had dinner with Jeff the night before. Uh. And Jeff signed my, my book. So oh, cool. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you know, obviously, his Here, There, and Everywhere book, which I highly recommend. And me, me too. And I, I was like, because Jack's, even though Jack's made all these legendary records, he's a fan of the Beatles like anybody oh, else. Oh, sure, yeah. And he's a fan of Jeff's. Yeah. And he asked Jeff, yeah. He's like, what did you use? Yeah. And he said, I use the Altex all the time. Yeah. He goes, we barely use the Fairchild. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. You use the Altex. Yeah. 
it's like, isn't that crazy? Because, you know, yeah. the Fairchild is an incredible compressor and it's amazing and everybody wants to have $45,000 worth of yeah. disposable income to buy one. Sure. But he said most of the time he used the Altex. He, yeah. He, it was quicker and easier to use. He used yep. them on vocals, he used them on bass. Yep. Well, there apparently he would use it going in mm -hmm. and in the mix. Yeah. So he'd use one to track with and he'd use it again to mix with. I think it comes down to... Just like anybody watching this, you, you have a couple of pieces of gear that you know how to use. Yeah. You know how to get a good sound out quickly. Yeah. And you're trying to keep creativity going. Absolutely. As opposed to going, oh, but the Fairchild is this incredibly transparent, bloody, or whatever, whatever the logic is. Yeah, right. That's not how you're thinking when you're working. Well, they didn't have a rack like this at Abbey Road. Right. They had three, comp I mean, three, two or three types of compressors, and that was it. But it's, it was great to hear yeah. from the horse's mouth, or at least from yeah. Jack, having having dinner with him the night before, that the Altec was his go-to compressor. I love it. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, 165s underneath. Um, I, I have those. I have a pair as well. Love them. That actually. Now, I've never done the 160 on vocal, but I have done the 165 a few times. That you know what's fun. funny? Yeah. I do the same thing. It's a 165 yeah. with a, a variable attack and release. I always just put it on auto. And yeah. Like oh, a yeah. 160. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> but isn't that funny? It's yeah. like... It, that's the feature that it has over the 160, yeah. and yet I just use it in auto. Well, if anyone ever wants their own decapitator, you take this out and you turn your attack all the way up. To so, the right? Yeah. Turn the attack all the way there, yeah. Um, and the release wherever, but basically, if you start hitting it hard enough, you just get this crazy distortion. Okay, I remember that? I'm going to yeah. remember that. Eric, you remember yeah. that? We're going to try it. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, it just eats it up, and you're going to slam it. And you, it, it will sound like uh, like a UFO. It'll go, it's got this crazy thing. I, I had it I going. Try. I did this crazy thing one time where I had a mic really hot in there, and I had the mains on, and I had this thing on as going as wild as it could, and it would feed back through the glass, and it was just really incredible sound. Nice. Yeah. That's why we do this for all these yeah. fun things. Okay, so what are these? Some AMLs. AMLs, and I love them. I. I've had 1073s in the past, um, and I love the BAE stuff. Yeah, Mark's a good friend of mine, and he's always been so supportive of us. They're wonderful. I love the BAE stuff, but these are really great too. Yeah, no, these are these are fantastic yeah. EQs. Um, but, I do I do love the, this for those that don't know, and I didn't know for years. Yeah, I'm no expert, as we all know. I didn't know that if you took out a 1073, they had an impedance switch on the back to match. In those days, ribbons and condenser mics because the impedance system. I didn't know that. Yeah. And to be honest, it wasn't until BAE started putting it on the front yeah. so we could use it. And that is such a difference yeah. in mid range. Absolutely. I couldn't believe it. Absolutely. I, uh, when I first started using it, I was like, whoa, this is literally like having an EQ yeah. control. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, really smart. No, I love these because, you know, the, the, old, uh, the old buzz was 1272s, mm -hmm. which are great, but they're only part of the front end. Yeah. Um, this the fact that this is actually the front end of a 1073 and not a 1272 there's a big difference in sound yeah they're wonderful so the germanium i love the germanium um is that an everything or is there something that you just have to use it on i love it on guitars and i love it on bass di it's actually one of the fattest bass di's i've ever heard oh fantastic yeah um the the gain and the feedback uh it's very, you, there's so many options for tone here. You can drive it and turn the feedback down. You can turn that down, turn the feedback up. The tonality is, it's crazy. You can get whatever you want out of it. What's this? What's a Funkin' work? That's uh, Oliver uh, from Tab Funkin' work, who's no longer with us. This was uh, V78. Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. In big letters that I didn't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Which is fantastic. Um, I've had V72s over the years. I have a pair. And they're great, but I gotta say this V78 has this, uh, again, mid-range punch that's just nice and round and... Um, yeah, that's definitely not the characteristic of a V72. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, these are much more forward than the V72s. I don't... When you were... You, when you, uh, this is just my own selfishness. When, I really only... I very rarely use V72s. Yeah. When I am using them, I'm using them on like bass amp or something right, like right, that. Right, right, I right. find them a little... And I, this is the wrong word. Everything, everything's always wrong, but a little softer. They are. Yeah. These are not soft. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. The one thing, so a lot of people don't understand when they look at this and they first get here, is that basically this is the gain. This is the gain of the preamp, and this is the attenuator of the input. So Interesting. Yeah. So 
basic, that being said, the this is a very sensitive uh, tube preamp, so it's very easy to overdrive. So good. basically, the uh, yeah, well, that is good. This is also another great homemade de decapitator. If you can find one, they're very hard to find. These, uh, they're you know, they're no longer made, but they're fantastic. You can get so dirty with them. Underneath, we got some beautiful Spectrasonics. Yes. Where did this come from? Do you know any history on that? I don't know. I, I think it was a guy that parted a console out, and, and he had like an eBay fire sale, and I just grabbed a few. I have two more. I just haven't racked them. Uh, but this is the classic Spectrasonics uh, EQ where you have stepped. There's the uh, there's always uh, something being added or subtracted. The only mm -hmm. way to get nothing is to actually disengage the low, higher, mid band. Mm -hmm. So this is a very old school design. It's it's uh, wonderful EQ. Um, I love it. Oh no, I'm. Uh, you know, we were talking about all the 70s classic New York yeah. records. Well, you ask uh, Jack or Shelley, um, Roy, unfortunately, is no longer with us. Right. That a, a lot of that stuff was done on Spectrasonics consoles. That. And that may, that may be a New York console. It could be. I yeah. Mean, that was, there was a lot of them out there. So who knows what, what history went through there. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's just a lot of options here for a, uh, an EQ of that era. Um, oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's healthy. <laughs> well, it was in the day, if you are, if, if you are Shelley, it was in the days where the engineers had a lot of input. Yeah. They would be talking to console manufacturers and being like, this right. is what I need. Same with, you know, in, in, in England as well. They would, they would demand certain frequencies. Yeah. The reason why Neve was so good, or one of the reasons, but um, was that the BBC were a big yeah. buyer of Neve equipment. Absolutely. I mean, they had studios all over the country. They had yeah. multiple studios just in London alone. And so the bands, they were asking for specific frequency bands that they were trying to have to boost, right. you know, boosting or cutting. Absolutely. And so I love that. I mean, yeah. that's that. Hence Trident, original Trident A range right. were designed yeah. and built by the engineers. Yeah, totally. So, um, uh, oh, great. Yeah, the little devil EQs. Yeah. I love these. They're very nebish, very fun, great on a snare or anything, really. And, of course, Harrison, which is people are starting to come back to again after, Incredible. after, after being reminded that Thriller was done on one. Yeah. The, one of the great, my favorite vocal EQs ever for mixing is the, the Har this Harrison right here, the Great River. It's um, wonderful. It's in, insane. And also kick drum. I mean, come on. It's just... Oh, yeah, you've got so much choice. It's made for kick drums. Yeah. It's beautiful. Shaping it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the Gakes. Now, this is special. You probably won't ever see one of these. This is a... There are not many out there. <laughs> so this... I have no idea what the model is, but... It's uh, it's a tube preamp that we think was used as like makeup gain for something that they made in broadcast, but it was converted to a preamp, and it has one knob audio level. That's that's it. That and all. what else do you need? Yeah, <laughs> and it is fat, man. I mean, it is fat. It's just American tubes, Beautiful. warm, uh, incredible on a bass DI. I'm assuming massive transformers in there. Huge. Yeah, I mean, look at it. it, it that big of a face plate with one knob. <laughs> for one preamp. That's amazing. Yeah. And then Chorus Echo. Chorus Echo. Got when I was a it. kid, every studio had one of those. Yeah. Those were fantastic. Um, TC Electronics. That's just, we just use that delay for our plate. Great. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, so you have a plate? Yeah. Which one? An EMT? 140. Beautiful. Yeah. EMT 140. Definitely worth no, uh, using and having. Um, and then the, the red channels. Yeah, gorgeous. And those, again, we use with Smiley, yeah. um, with your friend from Chandler. Yeah, it's amazing. They're incredible. Believe that. I have a PCM90 myself. I love it. I love PCM them. PCM70 is obviously yeah. a, definitely a classic. If, if yeah. digital technology be, can, can be considered to be classic, yeah. lexicons definitely. Yeah. I love it. Uh, the, the 90s, but, um, there's just these beautiful settings on there that, like the... The effect it does where it delays the reverb within yeah. the reverb. You can't do, there's not many plugins that are doing What's that. the setting we use? We have two vocal settings that we print on every vocal and then yeah. we choose whether to yeah. use and we print them back into Pro Tools. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fantastic. I think we have, oh, one's called like Vocal Magic or yep, something like that. That's one of them. Yep. Yeah, it's vocal just. Vocal Magic. It's just unbelievable. It there's, is. There's no plugin that does that. Nope. Not After at all. this interview, there might be. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> They'll be like, that dude over at uh, Boulevard Recording. We have right. one of these, which is fun. This is, the, if you have a UAD uh, card, you might recognize that. That's wow, the, uh, 22, 42, yeah. 24. 
And this was the reverb. It made its debut on Remain in Light. That was the first record it well, was Dave, ever used on. Dave was the engineer on that. Yeah, Jordan, yeah. yeah, exactly. And that was an MCI console. Yeah, was e it? Yes, because everything Eno did, because those um, incredible Berlin records yep. were MCI consoles. I love it. So when he came to LA and, and Dave did My Life at Bush of Ghosts yep. and Remain in Light with, with Eno, who, even though they only did, I think they did three albums together, yeah. he talks more about Eno than anybody else. Yeah, sure. And Zappa, he did work with oh, Zappa oh. as well. Two total geniuses, yeah. but different kinds of geniuses. Right. Um, he, uh, he I, I don't know, there's something about like the tape loops they were doing. Yeah. There's so yeah. much creativity with yeah. Eno that, uh, anyway. We, you know those BG records in the 70s were MCI. Oh, they were? Criteria, yeah. And we keep finding out from people, MCI fans, that Back in Black was tracked on MCI. Really? Mm -hmm. And mixed on an Eve. Ooh. That's a very healthy sounding record. <laughs> yeah. I would see I would have always assumed Neve because you hear the Neve EQ. Well yeah. You hear that you hear the so 60 110, 60 yeah, yeah, 110, yeah, yeah, 60 yeah. 110 or or 62 20 sometimes yeah. on the snare. But then it makes sense if it's recorded on the MCI but then mixed. It's so fat. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's amazing. I never knew that. Yeah, I'd love to know what tape machine it was. Yeah. Speaking of tape machines, whoosh, over here we have Studer A800. An A800. And you were saying to me you still get to use it? Yeah, we do use it. It's not an everyday thing, but you're, no. you're getting people requesting it. We do, yeah, we do use it. Um, do you end up doing like tape transfers? People come in and they want to... Once in a while. Once in a while we do that. Um, but, you know, actually I use it uh, in the mixed world once in a while just for color. You know, just when I have the leisure to, and time to do it. Some, you know, the, the best vocal sound I've ever heard was on tape. There's something about the saturation, the transformers, the tape, all of it. There's, it's just, you can't describe it in any other way that you can't get it in digital. It's not the same. I mean, some people are saying now it's getting much closer in digital, but um, I really love the way vocals sound on tape. Everybody say, oh, drums, you know. Yeah, drums are great on tape too, but the vocal sound is just incredible. So I use it for that a lot. I, I remember when I worked with Sadi, we would start off on tape, do all the basics on tape, then yeah. dump them into Pro Tools and yeah. edit, comp, you know, comp together takes. Yeah. Then we continue overdubs in Pro Tools, like yeah. do extra guitars. Yeah. We keep live guitars. Yeah. We do the vocals in Pro Tools, yeah. and then he would always dump the vocal once it was comped back yeah. onto tape. There you go. Yeah, there so. you go. He's smarter than me, <laughs> and you are. You are obviously as well. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's have a let's check out here. There's some lots of fun toys in here. So we'll start here, a must-have, which yeah, I don't have. The B-15. Yeah, b 15 Now, a lot of people are very, uh, you know, they swear by the 60s models. This is a 69, but the early, the, the uh, you know, the, the blue diamond, the old-school blue ones, everybody, oh, you know, that's the sound. I'm a big fan of the early 70s, late 60s models because... Um, it's more full range. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, you can do a little bit more with them. I find the 60s ones is literally just a boo boo. It's just yeah. got that. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. But it's... Um, very round. There's very not round. a lot of fidelity. It's pretty much one sound. Yeah. Where And I suppose on, on, on your process, with me, I favor the DI for the low end because it's cleaner. Sure. And then the personality. Right, absolutely. So, but if you were using maybe the low end more than maybe the 61, I, I, yeah. I don't know. Well, I put a 44 on this thing, and that's all the low end you'll ever need. Right. <laughs> Beautiful. So what have we got going on here? That's a Moog Voyager. Beautiful. From my hometown in Asheville, North Carolina. Beautiful. Yeah. Now this you were telling me about. Let's uh, talk about this. Oh, uh, this is the Lowry Heritage DSO organ. So this, if you've heard Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yeah, I think I might have heard that. Yeah. <laughs> that's this organ. That's this organ, uh, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Any kind of weird organ sounds you hear on a Beatles record in the mid-60s that wasn't a Hammond, it's this organ. Gorgeous. It's on Abbey Road, Here Comes the Sun. Um, and it's th they're granny organs. They're really, they're just granny organs, and Abbey Road happened to have one. Well, just um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Green Onions was just on an M series, wasn't on a B3. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, so, it was. So there's a lot of misconception that yeah. it's like, you know, like saying what's the best car, it's not always the most expensive. No, car. no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Now, nice, a beautiful collection of uh, pedals here. Lots of pedals. Oh, and we've got that, that's the, that's the fun mm. one. Yeah. Notice how I gravitate towards this. Yeah, man. Away. Yeah, that's, that's gorgeous. 
and oh. just a work of art the way it looks. Oh, I know. And of course, very smartly, because this is what we used to do in England, is it, it was Guitar reversed. Guitar to amp, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. A reason why I joke about this with Eric behind the camera is we have our BAE hot fuzz, yeah, and he does it the same way as the old yeah, English good. pedals, yeah. And I plugged it in wrong yesterday. <laughs> Eric can laugh at me. That's awesome. So a lovely collection. Yeah, we have a lot of the uh, Earthquaker devices stuff too. That awesome pedals. There's, there's a, I'm, I'm, the stone bender. Uh, yeah, I'm I a big tone bender fan. I have a homemade tone bender over here. I was looking at that, wondering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of a tone bender nut. Tube screamer. Yeah. I don't know the Ron Sound ha hair pie. What is that? That is a big muff. Oh, it's a big muff. Yeah, but it has mid range uh, that you can dial into it, which is really nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's an awesome. And the rat. Love the rat. Yeah, the fantastic Holy Grail and the cathedral. Yeah. <laughs> the diamond trem. Oh, the Strymon. Yeah. That's that's just something that I am seeing. That's so light. Yeah. Everybody I know raves about this. They're the best, man. Yeah? They're incredible. The blue, the reverb is my favorite, the, the blue sky. It's just gorgeous. Gorgeous reverb, especially if you're doing synths. Yeah, they have stereo, yeah. and they're just gorgeous, man. They're oh, that's got a pre-delay built yeah, into it? so many options. Beautiful. I love seeing DOD, because when I was a kid, it was like I couldn't always afford Roland or Boss Pedals. Yeah, right. And DOD was just that little bit cheaper. And well, I'm not seeing though. them around, because it's, you know, I'm a, I'm a sort of inverted snob. Yeah, I, like, yeah. I, like, <laughs> I like working class stuff, you know? Well, now they've reissued them and made them really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not what they were. No, right, yeah. They were these pedals we could afford as kids. Totally. And then my favorite is that uh, small stone. That's an original. Oh, yeah. The phaser. Yeah, small stone's amazing. Yeah. I have a... I have a, the Russian, the very first Russian oh, yeah. re-release, which unfortunately uh, got broken recently. So oh, no. Fixed. Yes. And the Klon. The Klon? The red guy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Kind of remember the ridiculous hype that offends so many is not of my making. Right. <laughs> you could, well, because his early pedals, his Klon Centaurs, go for yeah. two grand or so. Yeah. And are they any different than this? It's so hard to tell. Right. So but hard to tell. for the purists. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. We've got a Juno. Juno 60, lovely. And then what is this? These are more pedals? Yeah, that's all, that's all Earthquaker devices pedals. Yeah. Everywhere. There's a Whirly. Whirly, yep. Gorgeous. And this is a Gibson organ. Now this is a G101. So this was what uh, Ray Manzarek was famous for the Vox organ. Yep. Uh, but halfway through the Doors career, uh, he switched over to this organ. He did? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I did not know that. It's a really cool, and funny enough, the Lowry organ I just showed you, uh, Gibson and Lowry were using the same uh, voicings for their organs. I think they were joined uh, actually at some point. So you can get a lot of similar sounds out of this thing. Got roads up here. Got a roads. Yeah. Nice. And we just got amps galore. And now you, we, we were talking uh, how Blake Mills has been tracking a lot here with you. So we got the Bell and Howe, which of course I think he's, I don't know if he necessarily made it famous, but I mean, most people that, that talk about using the uh, film projectors as amps, it's probably yeah with Blake. Yeah, no, I mean, Blake, uh, when Blake comes, he does everything with Sean Everett, and he's uh, always got a complete <laughs> truckload of gear. Wow. Yeah. That's great. The Gemini. Yeah, that's an interesting Gemini because that is... I remember he's weighing a ton, yes. Well, th that's one without a speaker. Oh. Yeah. So that's actually a Gemini head that someone converted, which is kind of a rare. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I understand now. Yeah. And then what's the headstrong? I'm assuming that's like a Fender. It's a Fender. It's a Vibrolux. It's actually, look if you look at the name on it, it's, uh, it's a copy of uh, the amp that, um, it's a copy Sultan. of Mark Knopfler's amp. Yeah, hence the Sultan of Sweden. Yeah. yeah. Sultan amp. That's gorgeous. I heard... Uh, um, Shelly told me about Romeo and Juliet when they did that on Making Movies. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite songs with the yeah. Dobro. There's this incredible electric at the end. Right. And that was through a Marshall, which he fed through a Thurman uh, 
a Furman mic. Oh, I read that. Is yeah, isn't that crazy? Or I heard that, and I actually looked up that. Yeah, they're, they're like 150 bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe 200 bucks. Yeah, Nobody they have quite EQs figure. on them and everything. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. So this is the live room. Yeah. And this is absolutely gorgeous. And a lot of amazing records were made in this room. Yeah. Really beautiful. Did you? So how much was still original? Did you have to do much to it at all? Not really. I mean, we kind of we painted a little bit over on the booth, but but most everything was here. Pegboard was original. Or did you put yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Pegboard. This is oh, so it's thing. fantastic. So you redid the pegboard in there and kept the pegboard. Yeah. There. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. Now this wall was covered in carpet again. Right. Um, and it, the room sounded great, but. Um, we took it off to replace it because it had had some water damage and we took it off and left it off because it just sounded, it sounded great. Great. I think that, you know, sound city, uh, when I, when I've tracked there and of course everybody knows, nevermind was made there, you know, wildflowers, all yeah. those great records were made there, Johnny Cash records. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was a Vox showroom. Right. That's and right. It, it's just kind of a square box with pegboard and yeah. tiles that's flaking off from the floor. Yeah, right. And all we used to do was bring in these two high gobos and put them on either side of the drums and then record drums. There was no, yeah. there was no like studio designer that came in and designed no. that room. It just sounds really good. It sounds great, yeah. I love this. I love the yeah. wood surface curves like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it really breaks up a room that's kind of rectangular in a way. I mean, it's not because now, you know, this originally was a rectangular room uh, and the booth here was built in 1974. Oh, great. Yeah, they built it, they were doing these direct-to-disc records, Sheffield Labs, and um, Thelma Houston did a record here, and she had to have a booth for her and her background singers. Wow. Because there was an entire band, I think horns and everything out here. Now, is this, do you see photographs, is this where the drums were traditionally tracked? Not always. The the stuff that we know from like the wall era, Steely Dan, a lot of them were done right here actually. This, so facing out? Yeah, this is where then, Mother was done, right here. What was it? Yeah. 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 Mother, um, do you think they drop G, G, and C? Yeah. I, I, I love, uh, on my, one of my famous tangents, I love just thinking about how Roger Waters just wrote this beautiful record with pretty much G and C. Yeah, right, yeah. Absolutely. There's one four, maybe a five chord every yeah, now and then. Yeah, totally. And it's just a masterpiece. We have pictures um, of all their guitar, where all these mic stands are, even over to the Hammond, there's just lines of guitars. And you'll see the road cases, Pink Floyd. We'll have to get those stills from you. Yeah, so sure. You insert them. And they were using, they had, there's a great picture of a U47, and they were using the uh, front of a, uh, uh, what were those little speakers called? The uh, cubes. Oratones. The front of an Oratone is a yep. pop filter. Taped on, yeah. That's all they had here. They mixed the wall in Oratones and these those big Altec speakers, that was it. Yeah, I mean, Shelly told me the same thing. Yeah. It, you know, all the New York stuff was just big Osbergers or whatever in the walls. Or Yuri or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yuri's, yeah. yeah. This is a door, look at this. It's probably got sand in it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So it's this a, is the vocal booth and yeah. presumably you even do small tight drums in here if you want. We do drums in there a lot. So there's a nice selection of snares I see down there. Yeah, that's uh, the one in the middle is a 20s nickel over brass. And then we've got a Slingerland 60s on the left and then on the right is the matching uh, Ludwig Jazz Fest snare, the Ringo snare. Oh, beautiful. I don't have one of those. I have a Superphonic, Acrylite, and a Vistalite snare. I don't have that. I'm Ooh, a Vistalite heavy. snare, how's that sound? Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's blue. <laughs> it, you know, it sounds amazing because it doesn't sound like anybody else's snare. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Like we're talking about with the bell and howl. I Absolutely. Mean, we're, in, we're in this world where we love that stuff, where we, yeah. we're all looking for ways to be different because of God bless digital. Now yeah. we have access to every perfect sound or plugin or whatever made. Yeah. Now we're like, what can I do that's different? You know? Yeah, right, right. Which goes back to the spirit yeah. of rock and roll. Anyway. Now, Speaking of which, I was thinking, now you said that this studio was once, was it owned or started by Ed Cobb? Ed Cobb. Who is the co-writer on Dirty Water with the Standales, yep, yep. which for anybody from Boston is pretty much the theme tune for um, Red Sox. Yeah, they right. Play it at, uh, they play it at every game. And then, of course, um, he co-wrote Tainted Love. Tainted Love. Which is kind of 
That's actually, it's not kind of, it's very cool. Yeah. Because the soft cells cover of that in the early 80s was like so remarkable. Absolutely. So different to anything else at the time. Yeah. So Ed, yeah, Ed had this early on. Uh, he had a company called AVI. They did all these um, kind of library records, these disco records. Great. They also did some Liberace records. There were a bunch of AVI releases with Liberace. And basically anything Ed kind of brought in. He had some pet projects, some bands in here uh, Great. that he was doing. Um, but, at the, you know, he was in the Letterman. Um, studio was owned by Seymour Heller, who uh, was Liberace's manager. Um, I, I assume that him and, and Ed were friends or business partners at some point. There's yeah. rumor that a lot of that Standell stuff was done here. Which I would imagine is probably the, the case. Yeah. yeah. I met those guys, uh, you met them as well, we're talking yeah. a few years ago. I think it's only one or two surviving members. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So a quick look at the guitars. Yeah, yeah. Around. Now, you know I'm gonna like just go, of all the guitars to this, I, this I believe, 70s Yamahas I believe are the secret weapon when it comes to recording I acoustic agree. guitar. I agree. And I'm glad that everybody is starting to cotton on. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The, the red label. Oh, that is gorgeous sounding. Yeah. Yeah, and this is an FG-180, so this was like a cheap per guitar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's glued neck, it's made in Japan. Right. So it's made by people, real by people. people, yeah. And they were reverse engineering. They were pulling apart Martins, trying to figure yep. out, just like Honda motorcycles yeah. from the 60s, you know, they would trying their darndest to make incredible quality stuff at a fraction of a cost. Triumphs, they were trying to make Triumphs. They are trying to make Triumphs, yeah. And BSAs. And BSAs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, um, that's like the Elliott Smith model. That's my favorite, I, mean, yeah. I love that guitar. Yeah, I know that, I tell people that all the time as well. And uh, yeah, and you probably even to this day could probably still pick one up from, uh, I want to drop it, uh, yeah. on eBay for 300 bucks maybe. Yeah, totally. Two, 300 bucks. It's a steal. And it's worth every dollar because you, I'm sure you know this, better than I do, but you put a mic on this, it sounds great. You put a mic on a Martin, you're sitting there tweaking yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> it's got so much beautiful low end, yeah. you don't want in the track. Right, absolutely. Where this just... It's straight to the point. It's straight to the point, yeah. yeah. I, learned that, I learned that the hard way with working with skilled producers and engineers, that they were always going for smaller body or cheaper guitars to record. And I'm like, why is that? Yeah. It's just all that boom. It, now, J45? Yeah, that's an advanced jumbo. Oh, that thing has boom, but it is it is nice boom. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a work of art. That's gorgeous. Yeah, I've had that probably fifteen years. And do you ever use it DIing through amps and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That was a, that's a Dave Jordan thing. Yeah. A lot of those guitars that we assume were um, electric guitars were yeah. him plugging in and going through guitar amps because they just have a sparkle, don't they? Right, when absolutely. Yeah. Um, Yamaha? Yamaha, yeah, it's a U3 uh, upright grand, great piano. Oh, gorgeous. Oh yeah, very nice. That's gorgeous. I love uprights. This is a lot, lot, lot nicer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Tally. Yeah, it's like a. I think it's a '64 reissue. Love it. Hofner bass. Yeah, '67. Oh, beauty. <laughs> you're, you're with gonna, flats. With oh, oh yeah, always. You're gonna see a lot of Beatle guitars here in a second. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> what Beatles? Who are they? That was played in the Cavern Club, believe it or not. Although he's... Yeah, he's up there, yeah. And when he plays it, he goes... Yeah, he slides up. Yeah, he slides yeah. up. I, I watched him do it on that Live in Japan yeah. uh, thing. And yeah. he's singing. Yeah. So he's like moving his hand all over the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, got a good reason. Yeah, it's a trip. Yeah, it's a day trip. Yeah, it's a day trip, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm a dad. I make dad jokes. <laughs> Um, okay, next up, um, another beautiful looking tally. Yeah, that's one I built. Is that a 360 12? 
Yeah, that's the hard days. It's the good old, you know. Well, that's one of them. And then nice. the other one is. Nice. <laughs> Gorgeous. Yeah. I would say that the thing about Rickenbackers, I don't use them as much as I should, but they look amazing. Oh, they do look amazing. <laughs> yeah. They're beautiful. Yeah, exactly. And then the, the Ricky bass, which does get used a lot, even though people hate playing it because of this pickup, but it's... That's gorgeous. Yeah. And you got flats on that as well. Oh, yeah. Just a nice compromise with a Ricky because it's so mid range It makes sense yeah. to put flats on. Absolutely. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And then this is... There's a guy in the valley that makes these. Ooh. And they're these beautiful, beautiful Fender. Check it out. Beautiful Fender remakes. Oh, I love the neck already, baby. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. Well, it's like the Hendrix Strat, really. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I want to go back to the Telecaster. I brushed over it really quickly. Oh, you yeah, said yeah, that yeah. you had built that. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I just put it together. I did the... Oh, some weight to this. Yeah, it's a heavier one. It's kind of like the the Bakersfield tally. It's heavier and more girthy. Bakersfield being California country That's as opposed right. to Nashville country. That's right. For those that uh, follow country. Um, what do we got? Oh, another Yamaha. Yeah, no, and you got it high strung. High strung, yeah, man. Yeah, as in Nashville, people call LA tuning, and LA people call Nashville tuning. Yeah, that's a producer secret. Those guitars. Of course, you know I have one. Yeah. <laughs> Don Smith told me about this, so Don I moved over Smith. in. Don Smith. All right. One of one of the greatest yeah. engineers that ever yeah. lived. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, died about a few years ago. Yeah. I was, I was in New York making a record and uh, I couldn't go to his memorial service, which was at Sound City. Yeah. And uh, so I'm working with him in, it was October 95, I'd just moved here. Yeah. Making a record as a musician. And of course he did uh, Free Falling and yeah. all those great 80s. Shelley did the Down of Torpedoes right. and Refugee and um, Don't Do It Like That, all that kind of period with but, Shelley. But then yeah. with the 80s resurgence was Don. The Lynn era. Yeah. Yeah. And Don told me, that every time you think you're hearing a Rickenbacker on, uh, you know, and in the video you see Tom yeah, playing right, a Rickenbacker, right. he said it was two Telecasters. Oh, of course. Yeah. And he said it was one high strong Telecaster with one regular strong, and they just would double everything. And wow. all of those supposed 12 strings was two Tellys. So, <laughs> I believe and that it. was 95. And, I believe it. Yeah, so God bless uh, Don. What Absolutely. an engineer. Yeah. Listen to like Main Offender, the drum sounds. Yeah. Steve Jordan. A dear friend of mine was very close to him and did a lot of records with him. And, Who? Uh, David Emmerglock. I don't, didn't ever met David. He plays in the Counting Crows, Camper Van Beethoven. Well, uh, so was he in Camper Van and Cracker? Yeah. Because that's the reason why I worked with Don. Yeah. Because of Kerosene Hat. There you go. So I'm sitting in England. We've got our label boss who's like going, well, you know, here's a short list of guys we think. It wasn't even our label boss, it was our publisher. Yeah. He's like, here's guys that we think would be good for your sound. Yeah. And I go down, there's like five or six producers, and I see Don Smith, and I was yeah. like, wait there. Kerosene hat. And because I'm a sort of DIY I guy, yeah. I had read that they went and hired like a barn or something. Yeah. And rolled in a bunch of gear <laughs> and made the record. And I'm thinking, that's the kind of guy I want to work with. Yeah, right. A guy that just rolls in some gear and starts making a record as opposed right. to going to some pristine, beautiful, you know, pine designed 80s studio. Right. So that's, and of course, because I love the sound of that record. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Camper van were a big influence in England. Oh, right on. Yeah, well, we, you know, we liked all their left to yeah. center totally. American bands. That's beautiful. I'm glad, I, I'd like to know more. I, I, yeah, we could talk about Don all day. This, wow. That's is, an old one. That's a 63 Jazzmaster. I remember these were one of those things you could get for pennies. Yeah, right. That now, uh, now it just got the pre-CBS buzz. And that one's Beautiful. Uh, it's funny. It's a '63, but it has a slab neck and clay dots, which it's sort of a transitional '63. We think. Gorgeous! What yeah. a great neck. Yeah. It's almost a Les Paul, nice chunky bending. It's neck. a chunky, yeah. It feels like a almost like a bluesy neck. I uh, like that. Again, why we thought it's transitional because it's you know 
right after this, they were really thinning out the neck. Yeah, they were horrible. Yeah, yeah I've never been a Jazzmaster fan, but that neck is, that would make me a fan. Oh, right on. I know they're a trendy guitar to have, but I've yeah. never, you know, I like playing like bluesy rock style sure, sure. stuff and, and jazz, and so that, yeah. that's a good, great neck. Another Ricky? Yes. Oh, wow. That's the linen Rickenbacker. Little from... three quarter size. So I played that in the Cavern Club as John Lennon when I was 17 years old. Oh, you did? What, what was it? What did you do? Tell us. We, I had a Beatles tribute band. And we, you did? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know this. When I was in high school and we went the Nowhere Men and we went and we played the Cavern Club uh, three nights. When wow. I, when I was a junior in high school. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So you and Jack have to talk about that since he's got his, right. his story about wanting to go over there. Yeah. Oh. That's a 74. I, this is my favorite period of Oh, decisions. me too. Oh. And it's so light. I mean, you can hear this through these little tiny yeah. mics. Gorgeous. Oh, it's so beautiful. I mean, it's uh, really bad. You should give it to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is gorgeous. There's, uh, um, I, I personally, and I'm not an expert, but I personally like the mid-70s precisions. Me I feel too. like there's something that happened. I agree. I don't know why, but there was. Um, and that's great. the classic. Do you have it with the case and the speaker? I don't have it with the case and speaker, but I remember always wanting one of those from yep. uh, the movie That Thing You Do. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and that's uh, that's a 61 reissue SG. That's, yeah, there's a string funky on that. Oh, no problem. So I, I, I got to see uh, Tedeschi Trucks a few years ago. Oh, yeah. And I went and I saw, and I got backstage because of, you know, the guys, the band I was working with were friends. So we, I got backstage and I spoke to Derek a while. And of course, he's an incredible guitar player. And that's what he uses. Oh, yeah. The 61 reissues. Yeah. Because... And he's like, he just, he said, oh, I just went to Guitar Center one day and they had all these guitars on the wall and I picked up and I went through a few reissues and found the one I liked and that's what I used. That's incredible. Like no snobbery. I was like, like you. They're amazing <laughs> guitars. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, man, the Nashville. Wow. And that's kind of a, for the Uber Beetle fans, they'll remember Lennon had one of those around Paperback Rider. Gorgeous. Yeah. This is a real player's one. Yeah. I suppose it's the Chet Atkins, so it should be. Yeah. Let's see if I can remember any Chet Atkins riff. You know that? I'm not even going to pick on me. Gorgeous. Yeah. And it looks amazing. <laughs> And what is this? This is this is this like a It's a cooter caster, yeah. A cooter caster. Yeah. Is it even yeah, it is strung up. It's probably it needs a, a to be totally reset, but that's a it's basically that's a squire. What were they called, the squires that they made in that shape? Uh, I think it was the 51 squire, maybe they called them. Mm -hmm. And they made it, you know, they made them really nice with nitrocellulose paint and uh, and so I basically just gutted it, put a telly neck on it and put a, that's a Supra lap steel pickup from my old lap steel, and a gold foil in the neck. And that's kind of the Rye Cooter vibe. They're great for slide, and I have hoop, super heavy gauge flat wounds on there for slide. It's the She Talks to Angels uh, right, right, right. tuning, isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, and Rai Kuda. Yeah, right. Into the Purple Valley. Oh, I love that record. Yeah, so do I. I'm glad I can just say that and you know what I mean. Oh, I do. <laughs> Not everybody. Well, this is wonderful. And yeah. here's some, some simple things that I love. Um, like just things that you used to see in classic studios yeah. that you don't see anymore. Those are old Ocean Way. Uh, oh, they are? Yeah, and so are the big blue ones back there. Uh, I think, yeah. Beautiful. So this is an 87, but this just is, is not just any 87. This is a Klaus Hein 87. Oh, it is? Yeah. He's the guy. Which are gorgeous. Gorgeous microphones. A 269. 269. I have a wow. pair of those. Yeah. And a so that must be 60s? I think so. Yeah. You know why I know? It's pretty easy, actually, because it says made in Western Germany. Right. 
<laughs> and for those of you that don't know, the the black Neumann mics were used for broadcast. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? No. Nope. No, they did. So the, somebody didn't paint this. This is actually from the factory black, and you can see that the you know the under color is coming through. Um, but they're god, they're beautiful. <laughs> if you like sixty sevens, you like you might like these a little more. Dave Way has two sixty oh, cool. nines, and yeah. he always raves about them. Oh, they're great. So this is a pair of eighty fours. Pair of eighty fours. Yep. Beautiful. What are you using those mainly on? Hat, snare, acoustic guitar, actually great vocal mics. Oh, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, no, I think that some of the Sly and the Family Stone stuff was a KM84. Oh, interesting yeah. to hear. Yeah. Now. That's the guy. You know what those are. Oh, yes. Absolutely beautiful. So I have four of those, the D19. Yeah. Now, for those that don't know about the D19, it's quite, it, quite frankly, it's, it's sort of AKG's 57. It's yeah. kind of their all-purpose dynamic. Yeah. But those people that have read the, what do they call it, the Beatles, the, the gear book. Right, Recording the Beatles. Recording the Beatles, thank yeah. you. Um, started to find out that this was like what Jeff would use on everything. It yeah. Was overhead. Everything. Toms. <laughs> Hi-hat. Acoustic guitar. And piano. they went they went from being $85 to... <laughs> 600 600 bucks. Yeah. And... It's interesting, but what what I love about it is, first of all, it's it's just great to have one because of you know the sort of history of them. Yeah. But the fact that it just tells you again about the practices of recording that yeah. Jeff Emmerich is saying, oh, I just use the Altec because yeah, I knew how to make it sound good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just use these because yeah. I knew how to make them sound good. Absolutely. And, it's, and he had a, a plethora of mics he could have used at Abbey Road. He could have yeah. put C12s on the kit. Yeah. He could have put anything he wanted, 47s, but he he went with those, man. Because he knew how to make them sound yeah. good. Okay, so this is a 54? That's a 54, yeah. Beautiful. Gorgeous. And that's the later Mylar capsule, not the early nickel, which I actually prefer the later. There's a little bit, the top, I think, is a little bit crazier. There's, you can't quite get that with the nickel. And they use, the Beatles use 50s on everything, 50 series on, because one of the things I remember reading in that book yeah. actually was like where they had the same guitar amp what they would do is they'd use a different mic. So yeah. they might put a D19 on a yeah. Vox and then put a KM53 yeah. or 54 yeah. on the Vox to get a different sound. Absolutely. So same amp, but yeah. different mics for different sounds. Right. Great thinking. Um, and then, oh, okay. So I'll let you pick LU48, that up. LU48, which I'm a bigger fan of the 48. I have a 48 and a 47, so I know where you're going. The 48, uh, for those, you know, everybody says U47, U47. Yeah, that's the Sinatra mic. That's the blah, blah, blah mic. But the Beatles, as you can tell already, I'm a big Beatles fan, had the 48s. The 48s. So and they, they had could... all their 47s modded to be 48s. Right. So the benefit, I think, of having a 48 instead of a 47 is I don't, I don't use Omni much. Like it, yeah. a, a cardioid for a vocal all the time, maybe Omni if people are singing around, but I use figure eight all the time, especially doing an acoustic guitar and a vocal live. The cancellation's incredible. You don't lose much. It's incredible sounding. It's so useful to have figure eight. So I'm always a 48 fan. Wow. And this is a this is a Telefunken. That's Beautiful. A good one. Do you know what year it is? Um, it's actually one of the new ones, but it has a VF14 in it. How did you find that? Uh, eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask how much that cost set you back? Uh, I think I got it for like 1700 Yeah which I looked not too long ago, and there was one for 25, 2600. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy times. Yeah. C12? This is a Flea 12, yeah. Which a Flea 12? A Flea 12, man. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. I um, actually shot them out with some real C12s. Um, uh, I took them and used them on a session, and they had some real C12s somewhere else, and uh, we all picked the Flea 12. It just, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because it's a little newer or whatever, but... Mm -hmm. It just seemed like the, the three-dimensional thing that you want out of a C12. Maybe theirs weren't up to par service-wise, but these are killer microphones. It's interesting, I, I, and I'm, I've said this a lot before, but I was working with Jim Scott, and he has the old RCA Neve console, yeah. and he had completely, um, you know, completely recapped it, and yeah. you know, just brought it up to modern specs. And I, I said to him, you know, I was, I was a little like, oh, you know, What's it like? Do you not yeah. have that sound? He's like, no, it just sounds like it did when it was new, when I used it when it was new. Yeah, there you go. So I think that that's the thing about a lot of vintage I stuff. Think so. is a yeah. lot of the darkness is yeah is is basically old. The, old, yes. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> now got some pair of Now these are so. old. Yeah, these are not a matched pair, but what happened was I had bought 
this one uh, years ago, and I fell in love with it. And a buddy of mine, I at one point had two EMT 140 plates. And a buddy of mine was looking for a plate. And he also had a 44. I said, can I check your 44 out? Uh, sure. He came down and checked the plate out and he dug it. So I kept the 44 for a few days. And after experimenting, I realized that they were so close that they were a pair. As far as audio, I did all kinds of tests. I put them on amps, I put them on kit, everything. Did all these tests. I said, I don't think I'll ever find another 44 that sounds as much like mine as yours. And I kind of said, we got to do this. <laughs> right. So we did it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Traded a plate for a 44. Good. Hey, what's this hiding behind here? That is an old, uh, another old Gates preamp. Wow. Um, and it's on display right now because there, is a, there are no schematics for it that we can find because oh, wow. someone, basically this was, uh, came stock as this program amplifier, but someone put this ridiculous circuit on the back that has four EF-86s. <laughs> Do you think it was used as a guitar amp? No, I think it was used as a preamp, but oh, somebody, I, I mean, somebody went nuts with the EF-86 uh, circuit <laughs> that they put on the back. So it has this normal extra that's basically, it engages more EF-86, but um, yeah, that's kind of just decorative right now. <laughs> The question I wanted to ask, you got your studio speakers in here. Yeah. Do, you, do you ever feed feed music back in here and record it through the room mics? All the time. Great. Um, actually, this is crazy because this never happens. I won't say never because it just ha did happen, but there was a Perfume Genius record that was released last week uh, that uh, Blake Mills and Sean Everett did here. And the first song on the album is a cappella. And you hear a vocal and you hear people singing behind it. And what they did was they fed his vocal through the speakers and we had a choir of people in here and we would all switch seats. So I thought, well, surely they'll use his vocal that he had cut on the actual release. They actually used the vocal coming through these speakers into the room mics Beautiful. on the record. Yeah. Great. So yeah, it does happen. And it's great. a great way to sing vocals too. Yeah. You know, for people that don't like headphones, yep. put, put a few gobos we'll just up. the face. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you ever so much. Of course, thank you. Hey, that was amazing. Right on. I, this to me, um, and I see a lot of studios, and I, 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 I love doing studio talks. And yeah. I love, like you, well, yeah. you, you got this studio. Yeah. You, you love the historic places. and you love, We all love the sort of, uh, the juju that comes with going into a room when you know that other people have recorded here. And yeah. obviously I feel that because this is some of my favorite records we made in this room. And the fact that guys like Shelley were like telling me great right. things about the rooms. That is all really great, but actually, it's just, everything's so beautifully self-contained. You've got a lovely little lounge there, which Eric can grab some stills of as well while, while we're talking about it. But it's the live room's a perfect kind of size. Yeah. You've got everything that you need. I mean, this is a great place to come and make records. Well, thank you. It, the thing that a lot of people say, even though it's a studio, it feels like you're not at a studio. Yeah, It's understand. got kind of a home feel to it, Great. which I get a lot. And people, the number one thing people tell me, it's so fun to play music in that room. Like, that's what I get out of people. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you ever so much. Oh, thank you it. so much, sir. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Of course, leave a bunch of comments and questions below. I might even try and get Clay to answer some. Sure, I'd love to. Perfect. Thanks for watching. Have a marvelous time.